your audience and panelists. Um, my name is David Ibarra. I'm from University of Costa Rica. Welcome to this panel that has the title Diasporic Representations of Resistance and Memory Among the Overseas Chinese of the Americas, Europe, and Asia, which is part of WCAA. AAS 2021, Shifting Paradigms, paradigms in Asian Studies. According to what the president of the AAS invited this morning to have an intellectually stimulating day, we would like to contribute to this aim in this afternoon with the result of an editorial project that began in the middle of the Americas and it is about overseas Chinese. From the 19th to 21st centuries, China have, has played a crucial role as a source of human movements. Regarding these mobilizations, the host countries uh, developed uh, control policies and representations about the Chinese immigrants. Through various strategies, these migrant groups have attempted to integrate into the host societies in different ways. To go beyond its borders, the project of recovery of the historical memory of Chinese immigrants in Costa Rica, PREMECHI, for its acronym, acronym in Spanish, and is sponsored by the Sino Latin Network at University of Costa Rica, launched an international editorial initiative last year. The purpose of this initiative was to gather groundbreaking manuscripts about mobilities, biopolitics, representations, and migrant strategies, strategies from researchers inquiring into Chinese migration, not only in the Americas, but worldwide. The results of this project will be two books, one entitled Los Chinos de Ultramar, Represiones, Resistencias y Resiliencias, written in Spanish with uh, contributions featuring uh, several countries in the Americas and including scholars from universities in, US, in the US, France, Spain, and Latin America. And another book that is entitled Los Chinos de Ultramar, Movilidades, Tradiciones y Memorias, Overseas Chinese Mobilities, Traditions, and Memories, with some papers written in English and uh, some other in Spanish, with authors from the Americas, Europe, and Asia. The two volumes will be published at Editorial de la Sede del Pacifico, a publishing house at the University of Costa Rica. With the aim of presenting in advance these two books, we invited to this panel some of the scholars that contributed with them and that will be sharing some of their works here. For doing that, uh, we are going to proceed in this way. Uh, first, I wanna uh, introduce in sequence the panelists and the paper title. Then uh, uh, I uh, she will, or he will present 15 minutes to his paper. And then I continue introducing the second one and so on. At the end of the presentations, we will have a discussion session and then uh, we will be answering the questions from the uh, audience. So I warmly invite you all to write your questions in the Q&A box by clicking the option below in your webinar screen. Please make sure to whom you want to address the question. So thank you. Okay, so to begin with the first uh, panel, panelist, um, ben, uh, Benjamin Narvaez, Associate Professor from the Department of, the, of History at University of Minnesota, Morris. Professor Narvaez will be presenting his paper, uh, The Possibilities and Limits of Chinese Mass Rebellion in the in 19th Century Cuba and Peru. Good afternoon, Benjamin, the microphone is yours. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and here, let's get into this. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you all for being here. Thanks for this chance to share and to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, 
Um, so I want to begin with a story uh, briefly. In 1866, in the valley of Chicama near Trujillo, Peru, Chinese indentured laborers, known commonly as coolies in English or colonos asiáticos in Spanish, uh, rose up in mass on the Hacienda Cajaleque. The incident began when some of them murdered their patron, also who was their employer or master, and then collectively rebelled and seized control of the Hacienda. The Chinese nearly spread the rebellion beyond Cajaleque, but failed to take full advantage of the moment, enabling an outside armed force to eventually overpower them. Still, the Chinese had posed a real danger to the landholders of the region. That same year, all the way over in Cuba, in Matanzas, in that, that part of Cuba, nearly all of the coolies on the Ingenio de Sengaño, and the Ingenio is the sugar mill complex, uh, plantation complex in Cuba. So all of them on Desengaño rebelled. But in this case, no one was killed and a local military force arrived very quickly and prevented things from getting out of hand like they had on Cajanleque. In fact, large scale coolie uprisings in which the Chinese at least temporarily seized control in a, of an hacienda occurred a number of times in Peru, but appear to have never fully materialized in Cuba. This paper seeks to explain this discrepancy and in the process deepen our understanding of Chinese indentured labor in 19th century Cuba and Peru. These countries are rarely compared to each other, but they share the distinction of being the main Latin American destinations for Chinese indentured laborers during the 19th century. So at least 125,000 Chinese entered Cuba between 1847 and 1874, and another 92,000 went to Peru between 1849 in 1874. And in both places, they toiled under harsh slave-like conditions on plantations, especially sugar, but cotton also in Peru. Um, and they worked in other industries and as domestics and in urban settings as well. Um, and so if we, we, we look at the map, right? So, so all tens of thousands of Chinese then migrated from Southern China across the Pacific to Peru over here. And tens of thousands also went around the, the Indian Ocean and around the Atlantic all the way to Cuba over here. Um, and most of the Chinese came from the South, uh, Guangdong province in particular, and left from Macau um, in general for, for Cuba and Peru. And when they got to Cuba and Peru, um, I'm having a problem. They mostly ended up in the center western half of the island, which was the heart of the sugar industry in the 19th century, especially in like Matanzas in this area. You can see my mouse on the screen. And then uh, along the coast of Peru. So not really up in the highlands so much, but mostly as, as laborers in cities and on plantations along the coast of Peru, especially north of Lima, but also to the south of it. Um, as abusive as this labor system was, Chinese workers in Cuba and Peru resisted exploitation and found ways of escaping indefinite servitude. However, as indicated earlier, it was only in Peru that large scale independent Chinese uprisings fully occurred. The explanation for this difference uh, is rooted in Peru and Cuba's socio-political differences, I would argue, namely fledgling nationhood versus colonialism's persistence and abolition versus slavery's persistence. Peru was a young republic that abolished slavery in 1854. And this combination of factors made it more vulnerable to Chinese mass rebellion. In the wake of independence and civil wars, the fledgling Peruvian state was weak and had little presence in rural areas. Abolition and government weakness led to a poorly garrisoned countryside, which was to planters detriment when the Chinese rebelled since it took time to get the word out, uh, gather an armed force and get it to the plantation. Abolition also meant that coolies largely made up the labor force on coastal plantations, thereby denying patronos the ability to divide and conquer their labor force. Chinese did attempt large rebellions in Cuba, but they failed to fully materialize due to the island being a colonial slave society. First, as supplements to the slave 
slave labor force, despite having different legal statuses, coolies often worked side by side with slaves, thereby creating the opportunity for owners and administrators to pit them against each other in order to control their labor forces. Thus, when Chinese in Cuba collectively rose up, slaves often paid them no heed or helped stop them. Second, Cuba's status as a slave society meant Cuba, unlike Peru, had the political and military infrastructure to quickly put down a slave or coolie rebellion. So in the case of Peru, coastal planters definitely tried to divide their labor force as a method of social control, but they increasingly relied on Chinese laborers, which made this hard to do. On top of that then, the weakness of the Peruvian state and its minimal policing of the countryside played this crucial role in allowing collective, um, Chinese to collectively rise up and seize control of the plantation. So like, like I was saying, right, the, the, the countryside was basically the preserve of the elite landholders of the Asindados. And so they had a lot of autonomy, but this autonomy was a mixed blessing for them. Asindalos had the power to run their plantations as they saw fit, including having free reign to treat their Chinese workers like slaves in Peru. But autonomy resulting from the weakness of central authority could pose a real problem since it meant that official policing and military powers were insufficient to maintain order and quickly put down any disturbances that surpassed the, the plantation's own policing powers. So the historical records indicate that, eight, that the 1866 incident at Cajanleque I mentioned at the beginning was the first of these major uprisings to occur. And so this was in um, the valley of Chicama um, in northern Peru along the coast, north of Trujillo, in this area, kind of near Ascope, um, where this incident happened. And if you look at the map on the right, it, the Cajanleque was in this area between Paihan and Chocope. So on August 13th, 1866, nearly all of Cajanleque's Chinese seized control of the hacienda after a small group of them murdered their patrono, uh, Antonio Larco. What sparked this violence was Larco's decision to sell some of his uh, Chinese workers to another hacienda without their consent. But undergirding this upheaval was a history of exploitation and abuse on the plantation. Thus, when Larco rounded up his Chinese workers in the morning before work that day and informed them he was selling eight of them to another hacienda, many had reached their breaking point already. One of the coolies refused to go and tried to run away. And when Larco caught him, the desperate individual yelled out for his compatriots to kill Larco. Uh, to which a number of them responded, beginning to attack Larco and beat, beat him to death with their tools. With Larco dead, all of the Chinese, save Larco's Chinese personal assistant, then began to rebel. The colonos asiaticos on the plantation could not be stopped from taking control. Outnumbered, the haciendas administrators and Peruvian employees hid or fled. One of the mayordomos was able to get on a horse and escape for the town of Chocope to notify the governor of the district about the uprising. And another mayordomo fled for Paihan in the other direction, hoping to find support. Finally, some of the Chinese, uh, non-Chinese workers, excuse me, on Cajanleque left to find Juan Bautista Maurici, the co-owner of Cajanleque and co-patron of the rebellious Chinese, who was currently on a nearby hacienda um, known as Salamanca. Clearly, Cajanleque did not have enough non-Chinese workers to neutralize the uprising, nor was there a military force nearby prepared to stop the rebellion in its tracks. The Chinese controlled the hacienda, but they decided to head for the Hacienda Salamanca to unite with their countrymen. Appro approximately 85 of them began marching down the road armed with their tools. And about halfway there, they ran into Maurici, who convinced them to turn around and return to Cajanleque by telling them that Salamanca's Chinese had heard about the uprising and had left to join them via an alternate route. But upon returning to Cajanleque, the rebels realized 
uh, Maurici had lied, and so they threatened to kill him. A terrified Maurici then fled. Nevertheless, before the Chinese could take further action, 50 armed men from Paihan entered Kahanleke, and then the governor of Chocope and 25 more armed men from that city arrived as well. After an armed standoff, the militia force succeeded in apprehending the Chinese. Several coolies died or were seriously injured in the fighting, but order had been restored in Kahanleke. This uprising struck fear in the hearts of many and made the dominant classes reconsider how best to protect themselves. If coolie labor relations were not going to change, it became increasingly clear to many that they needed to station a permanent armed force in the area to ensure tranquility. This was the conclusion reached by the head military commander in the city of Trujillo and the governor of the district of Chocope as well. So on August 17th, four days after Larco's death, the prefect of Trujillo in Trujillo did call for the stationing of some members of the city's public armed force to, to police the area. But it doesn't appear that a permanent arrangement of this sort was ever made. So the Peruvian Hacendados and officials clearly didn't really learn their lesson from Cajanleque. In 1868, in the department of Lambayeque, Chinese workers who had long suffered abuse on the Hacienda Pucala killed their co-patrono Rosendo Isaga Arbulu and then seized control of the Hacienda and then tried to unite with Chinese on the nearby Hacienda of El Combo. And so here we're talking about if you look at the map in the, in the left, we're talking about Lambayeque to the north of, of the Valley of Chicama. That's where this happened. Um, and Rosendo Isaga Arbulu owned this plantation of Pucala with his brother Manuel. Um, Manuel obviously survived, but Rosendo was, was killed um, by his Chinese workers. And the event began on June 9th in the morning when Rosendo started to berate his Chinese workers during roll call. Um, he became really abusive and threatened to whip them because one of the Chinese was missing and he started blaming all of the Chinese on the plantation. And so they responded by beating him to death with their tools. Again, an overseer, overseer fearing for his life fled for Chiclayo to get help. So there wasn't enough of a presence on the plantation to stop it in its tracks. While um, in the meantime, the Chinese took over the plantation and then marched for El Combo to find their compatriots who labored there. And they were able to join up with some of them. But before they could spread the, the uprising to even uh, more places, an armed force, outside military force, finally arrived and restored order. But the incident at Pucala only reached this level of chaos because the Chinese so outnumbered others on the plantation and there was no organized police force close by. In September of 1870, Peru experienced its most spectacular Chinese mass rebellion when 1,200 to 1,500 Chinese from various haciendas rose up in the coastal valley of Pativilca in the province of Barranca in the department of Lima. So if, if we look at the map, talking about this area in the northern part of the department of Lima. Humberto Rodriguez Pastor has done an excellent job of analyzing this uprising, but it is worth considering it within the comparative context of Chinese mass rebellion in Peru and Cuba. Because once again, there was no military police presence in the area prepared to protect landowners and quickly put down any disturbances. Locals in the end were stuck to defend themselves until a larger military force from Lima could arrive to the region to stop this uprising that began on the plantations of Araya Grande and Upacá with Chinese killing non-Chinese and then spreading to other plantations and trying to attack some of the cities in the area. Ultimately, this armed force from Lima did arrive several days later, an armed force of 175 men who then proceeded to kill 300 of the Chinese and capture most of the others. But this was a tremendously chaotic, uh, traumatic event in the, in the region. 
Following Patibilca, the prefect of Lima called on the national government to establish a permanent rural guard in the area. But this was never done in a permanent fashion. And not surprisingly, large scale uprisings in which the Chinese seized control of a plantation or more continued well into the 1870s. Finally, in terms of Peru, the War of the Pacific from 1879 to 1883 created the opportunity for one last major Chinese uprising. This was different in that this was not an autonomous movement since the Chinese joined the Chilean invaders, but it still reflected Chinese grievances, the weakness of the Peruvian national government and the government's inability to control the countryside. In the end, roughly 4,000 Chinese fled plantations and joined Chilean forces during their campaigns in Peru. While not all Chinese supported the Chileans, the War of the Pacific had clearly created an opening for violent collective action. So let me wrap this up by, by quickly comparing this to Cuba. The importance of having a divided labor force and more robust government support for social control becomes all the more apparent when comparing Peru to Cuba. Chinese mass uprisings failed to fully materialize in the Spanish colony precisely for these two reasons. Coolies did not replace slaves in Cuba, they supplemented them. Thus, unlike in Peru, the two coexisted in the Spanish colony and plantation labor forces were not as homogenized. In fact, Chinese were often in the minority on plantations. Um, exploitation could encourage unity among them, but in general, difference and discord often characterized the relationship and planters stoked this type of divide as much as possible. And so this was a terrible context for creating um, Chinese mass rebellion. Uh, we can see this on multiple occasions when the Chinese attempted to rebel and, and slaves stopped them from proceeding with the rebellion. This was true on the Ingenio Jesus Maria in 1857. It was true on the Ingenios El Porvenir, El Carmen, and La Luisa in 1863. And it was true in the Ingenio La Paz de San Juan in 1866. On top of that, the, uh, Cuba had a stronger government military presence policing power in the countryside to preserve order, to prevent slave rebellion and by extension, Chinese rebellion. And we see the civil guard and other police forces arriving numerous times when the Chinese tried to rebel. This was true in 1863 on El Porvenir and El Carmen. And it was true in the incident on Desengaño that I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk. Um, in that case, they rang the bell repeatedly, got the word out to the, the local captain and the police force arrived quickly to prevent things from getting out of control. And this type of situation and response continued into the 1860s and 1870s. So the last thing I will say, I wanna conclude with is that it was only in the context of the 10 years war from 1868 to 1878, Cuba's war, first war of independence, that the Chinese rebelled in large numbers and truly threatened Cuban elites and the colonial government. But like the War of the Pacific, this was not an independent Chinese uprising. It was four to 5,000 Chinese joining um, the larger fight for Cuban independence and to end slavery um, and fighting alongside slaves, free people of color and whites. So in the final analysis, this war did show that differences between slaves and coolies could be overcome under the right circumstances, especially when there was a larger breakdown of government authority in the context of war. Otherwise, Cuba and Peru were quite different when it came to the Chinese mass rebellion. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Hey, we're going to continue with uh, our panel with Lorena Puya, Assistant Professor of Spanish and Latin American Cultures at Arizona State University. She will be presenting an interesting paper with the title Migration, Power, and Racial Solidarity about, about the Chinese presence uh, in the Andes. Welcome, Lorena. <laughs> 
Thank you, David, for the introduction and, and for the opportunity to talk with all of you, actually. Um, so I'm just going to start um, reading, and but let me show my screen before I forget about this. Um, okay. All right. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to share the screen this way because otherwise I get a little bit dizzy. Um, Okay, so as Rodriguez Pastor acutely points out, Cooley migrants should be considered as pioneers in a society that was foreign and hostile to them at the beginning. Their cultural and sociopolitical importance in the history of Peru is unquestionable. Not only did they work in plantations, once free, they opened business or continued their agricultural work as wage earners. Some of them became enganchadores, it is middlemen uh, middle who recruit other Chinese workers for the land owners. Over time, interracial marriages allow them to become part of the Peruvian society and to play important roles as intellectuals and politicians. The fragmented and unknown story of Francisco Vaca exemplifies this kind of experience. Um, Francisco Vaca was a Chinese coolie, and he is my great, great, great grandfather. So, uh, he married to a Peruvian woman, became a merchant, and then a money lender. His two sons' son, um, Enrique Baca Niño Ladrón de Guevara, became the foreman of different plantations, developed a relationship of, of trust with the land owner, Genaro Barragan Muro. He was the owner of multiple um, plantations in the Lambayeque area. And um, this is the area that I'm going to be talking about. This is Lambayeque and um, these are the two main provinces. Um, I think Benjamin had better maps than me, but I just wanted to uh, basically locate uh, where in the north coast of, of Peru. Um, so Enrique Bancaniño Larón de Guevara became the foreman of different plantations and developed a relationship of trust, as I say, with the land owner Genaro Barragan, who married to an Afro-Peruvian woman and later became the second mayor of Chinese origin over ever recorded in this Andean country. And the first one was recorded by, um, um, is, sorry, is Martin Laos, who was the mayor in 19, 1923 in the Amazonian, um, well, it was, yeah, Amazonian basically, Chanchamayo in Junin. Um, so this work demonstrates that as much as racial discrimination was on the basis of Chinese exploitation, interracial solidarity repeatedly appeared as a means of integration. So I'm gonna start with the story of Francisco Vaca, a coolie in the Andes. The information gathered here uh, in this work derives from my family oral history, uh, a few archival documents and an interview with Genaro Barragan, an old plantation owner from the North Coast of Peru. Um, so this is, this is the actually, is the, the beginning part of a larger um, project. So bear with me, please. So who was Franci Francisco Vaca? It is difficult uh, to know with precision. I found his name on his son's death certificate, which is here. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Um, uh, okay, so the same document states that Francisco Vaca's wife, Agueda Niño Larón de Guevara, was a Peruvian woman of unknown race. Some members of my family and, and, the Gen and Genaro Barragan Muro, the heir of the plantations where my great-great-grandfather worked, affirmed that Francisco Vaca was almost certainly a coolie. My mother and my, uh, my great-aunts used to mention that he arrived at the Lambayeque region with a brother. The latter died by hanging. It was common belief that his brother um, might have had debts or been involved in brawls. There is no proof of such incidents, except for the fact that different family members seem to share that knowledge. If Francisco Vaca was indeed a coolie, so should have been his brother. If so, his death should surprise no one. Rocas Torres, an expert in the history of Lambayeque region, in Sanya in particular, describes places such as Cerro La Orca, the Gallows Hills, where runaway slaves and disobedient Chinese men were punished and hanged. Francisco Vaca's whereabouts are not clear either. I was able to talk with Genaro Barragan Muro, who at the time, that was in 2014, um, lived in Chiclayo, Lambayeque's capital. 
it was a common belief, he said, that upon finishing his contract, Francisco Baca had a small store in Chiclayo, in the main plaza, and later became a money lender in the same place. He also repeated a family, a family rumor that he and his son, Enrique Baca Niño Ladron de Guevara, had personal disagreements that pushed the offspring far from the paternal house in Chiclayo. But did Francisco Baca always live in the, this city? It is difficult to know. Where did he arrive first? That has not been determined yet. What we know, however, thanks to his two sons' son, is that he was from Guangdong and should have arrived in Peru during the first Chinese immigration wave in the late 1840s. His last name was somehow forgotten. My mother and great aunts have repeated, though, that it was something like, uh, excuse me, my pronunciation is not good, Yung, Yung, or Tun, and Tang or some name phonetically close. So Jung San, Jung Chan, something like that. At least that is what they, um, they heard from Enrique Baca Niño Larón de Guevara. I have not been able to verify these possible names in, in the Lambayeque's Regional Archive and the Chinese Association in Chiclayo keeps records only from the 1940s onwards. Nonetheless, I have been able to find information about a Spanish captain called Francisco Baca. The Lambayeque Regional Archive keeps records of slaves' purchases in which this Spanish captain appears to have acquired three African slaves in 1818, probably after the, so here's what I think, that probably after the abolition of slavery in 1854, Captain Baca um, or his descendants replaced that labor, the labor of African slaves with indentured Chinese workers. It is possible that my ancestor Francisco Baca had worked for him and received the name of the family. Most likely he, this could have been his baptism name as it was um, in common practice. After Francisco Baca's contract ended and the bondage with his master was terminated, it is possible like in other cases that he accumulated some capital and opened a small business in Chiclayo. Just as Genaro Barragan Muro pointed out in, in our interview, it is difficult to prove how my ancestor could have become a money lender. Maybe a stroke of good luck allowed him to position himself um, better than other fellow Chinese men at the time, I don't know. What is true is the fact that the Lambayeque Regional Archive keeps an obligación de deuda a Francisco Baca, which is a promissory note to Francisco Baca from October, uh, well, it's in 19, sorry, 1859. It states that Jose Maria Arizola and his wife, they're members of the community in Chicago, committed to pay, to pay back 6,000 pesos over a period of eight years with 2% annual interest. At the end, the document shows the signatures of all those involved in the transaction, except for that of Francisco Baca. The scribe signed it instead. Would it be possible that Francisco Baca had some pecuniary capital but did not write um, or sign in Spanish that is likely for the time. So like other former coolies at the time, Francisco Vaca tried to advance his social condition and most likely succeeded to some degree. Although there is a scarce documentation, it is likely that Francisco Vaca opened a small store in or near Chiclayo's main plaza, as Genaro Barragan Muro indicated. It is also possible that he had started lending um, some money, perhaps with the help of his wife, who had, um, had the last name of um, Lad Ladron de Guevara, Niño Ladron de Guevara. In any case, Francisco Vaca's marriage helped him to establish his new home in the North Coast. Most importantly, if his case represents the social mobility of a first generation Chinese indentured worker in Peru, then his son would have benefited from it and replicated his efforts. So now I'm gonna talk about the next generation, which is the, um, the, um, the Tucson son, who is a major. And Tucson is the, the name that we use to talk about the descendants of Chinese people in Peru. So as suggested before, national economic development has been tied to the Chinese presence in Peru. This progress was also subjected to political changes in the region, wherein such workers, coolies and their descendants, the Tucsanes, dwell. One way or another, Francisco Baca or Jun San or Tang must have obtained a certain social status, which his son would have enjoyed as well. 
According to my great aunts and my mother, Enrique Baca, Niño Lerón de Guevara, read newspapers in Chinese, but that would have not been possible without his father's economic capacity to support such an education at the time. Nevertheless, after leaving the paternal house, Enrique Baca, Niño Lerón de Guevara had to look for new economic means of survival. How could that have happened exactly? It's, it's really uncertain, but expanding the However, expanding the interethnic connections, Enrique Baca Niño Ladrón de Guevara married Santos Baca Granda. Okay, this is, sorry about this. This is um, Enrique Baca Niño Ladrón de Guevara, the center in white. And it's a very old picture. It's the only one that I found in the family. Um, and then this is Santos Granda, the wife and one of the daughters. So he, Mary Santos Granda, and family accounts describe her as a samba, a colonial term used to describe some Afro-descendants, a mix of indigenous and black slaves. The couple probably met while Enrique Baca Niño Ladrón de Guevara was working for La Otra Banda del Taime, which was a sugar plantation right outside of the Sanya regional limits. There, my great-grandfather, Eralgo, he was something like a, like a manager, something like a, um, sorry, like a major there, um, the uh, Genaro Barragan actually said that he was something like a governor. Um, later, the couple moved to the Tres Thomas Mill in the province of Ferreñafe, own, owned by the same Barragan family and where Enrique Baca, Niño Larón de Guevara managed their property too. The Barragan family also owned the Hacienda Luya, the Luya plantation, one of the most important sugar plantations in the region, along with those like Cayalti and Pomalca. The geographic proximity of Monsaña, Luya, and Ferreñafe very well explained the couple's encounter and displacement, especially if, because all these uh, plantations were owned by the same owner, so they may have been moving around a lot. The geographic movement of Enrique Baca Niño Larón de Guevara and his wife goes hand in hand with their ethnic and socioeconomic situation. As Roca Torres acutely observes, Saña is a historically black community. Many African slaves were taken to this province to work in the sugar plantations, and many stayed there after the abolition of slavery in 1854. Jose Arbulu, the region's subprefect, reported that since 1874, La Otra Banda del Time had recorded 40 Asian indentured workers and other Chinese freedmen. Thus, interracial marriages and other interregnic bonds should have been a spontaneous consequences, especially in plantations like La Otra Banda and Luya which belong to the same family. The connections between Afro and Sino-Peruvian were highly likely. The Baca and Granda marriage was not shocking and definitely not unique in that area. It not only exemplifies a social pattern, but it is also indicative of the economic circuit in this Northern region. After departing from the paternal house and possibly passing through Saña, Enrique Baca Niño Ladrón de Guevara would become the mayor of the lands where he formerly worked. Genaro Barragán Muro, the heir to Luya, Tres Tomas, and La Otra Banda plantations, explained in our interview that my great great grandfather was a trusted man for, for the Barragán family, and he was a serious man, quiet and respected. He had the trust of the family, that's why he oversaw everything there. After working in La Otra Banda, Enrique Baca Niño Ladrón de Guevara moved to supervise the Tres Tomas rice plantation and the first hydraulic mill that was built there by the Barragan family. There, these two sons supervised the rice production from seed time to meal processing. This plantation would give its name to the small district founded there in 1951. Its name changed to Manuel Antonio Mesones Muro in 1965. Genaro Barragan Muro was its first major, and he, he was the first major at, during, he was in his 20s, but it was because that um, his father owned all, all those lands. And Enrique Niño, uh, I'm sorry, Enrique Baca Niño Lerón de Guevara became its second one. For more than a quarter century, Enrique Baca Niño Lerón de Guevara built a reputation for his work as a plantation foreman. In such a position, he did not criticize the social order in any radical form, but instead gradually advanced the land owner worker relationship. It is clear though, that 
that the social circumstances change, allowing to Sanes like him to occupy new social positions without raising eyebrows or without significant questioning. It seems that as if the Tucson identity was seamlessly integrated into this community, maybe even in an invisible manner. At least this is what happened in Ferreñafe. Amid economic and technological changes, his personal relationship with the land owner, his wife, notoriously amicable character, as well as his friendship with other members of his district facilitated his appointment as a mayor in 1956. He was 80 years old when he started working for the government. His advanced age was probably the reason why he left the position so prematurely in 1956, so it was just one year. Overall, Enrique Vaca Niño Ladrón de Guevara's socioeconomic condition was not bad. His social mobility resulted from the confluence of at least three aspects, racial solidarity, that is interracial marriage, relationships of trust with the white land owners, and respect among workers of different racial backgrounds. Changes in the regional boundaries or redrawing of district lines, as well as democratic developments that did not impede, um, sorry, changes in the regional boundaries or redrawing of district lines, as well as number three, democratic developments that did not impede him from occupying a municipal seat. All of those reasons helped him occupy um, um, the position of major. So that Chinese integration in Peru is, um, is not the product of any radical movement, nor the result of any armed ideological revolution, at, at least not a big one, because yes, as Benjamin mentioned, there were a lot of um, uprisings, right? Um, so instead, and without idealizing this situation, it has been the product of a subtle and slow process of interracial solidarity, or what may be also called an economy of affects. Uh, that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Mm -hmm. And as third panelist, I introduce Huiyin Huo from the Department of Sociology at Johns Hopkins University. She will be talking about his paper, Cup of Nostalgia. Burgua tea and coolies coffee in Singapore Chinese communities in the 1920s. Good afternoon, Wayne. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for uh, David to organize the panel. Uh, I'm writing up this paper as part of my research project about the public sphere and the um, colonial uh, sanitary standards in. Asia, like especially Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. And this is the portion about Singapore. And about uh, the sanitary part, I think I look at uh, how the colonial government tried to use hygiene as a pretext to suppress and regulate the public sphere of the working class people. Uh, here come with the, uh, because since my paper have detailed uh, the regulation and how working class initiative confronted with the Burjah's interest of collaborating with the colonial power. And I think I would like to use my 15 minutes of this presentation to talk about a more like a bigger questions. Uh, that is something uh, I really want to seek your uh, feedback and comments and in relation to the paper I'm working on. So I think the big problem that I will have, I mean, in terms of the discussion about public sphere and the class divide in the ethnic Chinese community, um, this is about the you know, very notion about to what extent we can talk about people, not only the different taste or preferences of drinking tea or coffee or organizing union or collaborating with colonialism. But to what extent that just because they migrated from China and so we have a category called that like, overseas Chinese or Chinese diaspora. And this question has been proposed by the cultural uh, scho uh, the, the scholar uh, the um uh, Shu Mei, I mean, she has a very powerful critique about the whole entire paradigm of Chinese diaspora or Chinese overseas. I mean, this is pretty much the field of study I have been working for decades, I mean, including my first book and the courses I teach. But Shu Mei has a very uh, fundamental idea, I mean, in terms of the confrontation of uh, the question of power, that how we understand that uh, diaspora, they, by definition, they are migrants, and they move to a new settlement or a new country. And theoretically, I mean, in all 
all civil society, uh, if we don't consider the reality and the problem of racism, racism is something we have to overcome. So theoretically, we should let all dust problems I mean, to be identified locally, uh, rather than thinking about them as, uh, as kind of dust problems or that is oversee to somewhere else. And so in Shishu Mei's world, the paradigm of China diaspora become a practice of seal extermination that internalized Western category of the seal. And finally, and most importantly, the suppression of its ethnic minorities for their claims on and contribution to the nation and the disbuilding of some of the sovereignty claim of the minority groups. Uh, meaning that uh, if we use diaspora or overseas Chinese as a framework to uh, structure our research question. And the first problem is that we don't see them as local and we kind of continue to think about them as um, as, um, um, as, as someone as, a, as, as new or not native. Um, so for in relation to the question, um, uh, this research paper I, I, I wrote for uh, this uh, edit volume, I uh, focus on Singapore. Uh, Singapore, of course, today Singapore is a sovereign state after 1965, the sovereign state um, where the uh, GDP per capita the, the same level as the United States of America. But in the field of Chinese, because most of the Chinese migrants before World War II, about 90% concentrated in Southeast Asia or the region we call Nanyang. Um, Southeast Asia become a kind of a hot inter imperialist competition for the resources that Japan tried to take over Southeast Asia and one important strategy was to work with a uh, Chinese diaspora that Japan have the concept of Chinese diaspora that Chinese left uh, China and in Southeast Asia and Singapore become very important like uh, uh, a station for Japanese expansion and also for Chinese government to mobilize Chinese overseas support uh, to support China. So Chinese overseas or Chinese diaspora has been a very powerful paradigm before World War II for both the Chinese government and also for Japan. I mean, because for Japan, they would try to build up the thesis about how uh, Chinese overseas in Western colony, they should actually work with Japanese Pan-Asianism. And for Chinese government, that migrant in Southeast Asia, uh, they are extension of Chinese, like the, they are Chinese people, because Chinese uh, still uh, back that time have the idea of using goodness principle, like uh, as uh, a nationality by blood. So the 75% of Chinese population in Singapore in the colonial time consider as an extension of Chinese state power that the uh, uh, Chinese have very strong, uh, make strong effort to mobilize the Chinese, uh, the support from Singapore. And they did well, I mean, you know, before the Sino-Japanese war uh, in World War II. And for my paper, I focus on 1920s as a moment that Chinese national mobilization continue, but not that much as the previous wave, like 19, before 1911, there was the anti-dynasty uh, anti uh, revolution that Singapore was a very important uh, foundation for uh, Chinese revolutionaries and reformists when they wanted to uh, or collect resources to uh, carry out the political agenda in China and Singapore. It's a very important base. And in 1930, Singapore was the most uh, important, like uh, the headquarters of Chinese overseas donation to uh, the Chinese anti-Japanese movement. And 1920 was the time that uh, the Chinese influence continue, but working class population or the uh, those people who didn't have that much money before and after uh, to for uh, China's either political transition from dynasty to republic or China's uh, war with Japan. 1920 was the day case that the working class organized their uh, own campaign uh, to uh, confront were the Burjas elites that uh, well to do Chinese that they dominated most of the um, native place association. So that is the decade that I focus on. I want to look at whether uh, the crash distinction could be an alternative framework for us, for us to analyze the paradigm of Chinese diaspora and also eventually to uh, figure out that how to fix uh, some problem, especially Shishima's concerns about the homogeneous consum uh, uh, homogeneous assumptions about Chineseness uh, in this paradigm. Uh, who are the working class I'm talking about? So in this page, I uh, kind of introduce a term called Hainanese. Uh, Hainanese are a migrant from China's Hainan Island. 
And in colonial census, they actually have different spelling, like the Hainanese, the, the, uh, the term I use is copied from 1931 census, but in the previous census it's called Highland. And in the I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but they, David, I think you need to close if you can the chat. I think we have been Zoom bomb and I, yeah. Uh, the chat? Yeah, the chat is very bad. Somebody's spamming it. So yes, so I think it's better if we just close it. Oh, I close the chat. Oh, me? No, 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 no. David, oh. close it. We David are has to close, shut uh, it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Uh, should I do anything about my screen? No, no. You didn't do anything, you're, you're fine. Just... Oh, okay. Uh -huh. It is okay, Wayne, you can continue, thank you. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so uh, the uh, the working class population or the uh, the uh, group of the people uh, who will uh, show their uh, agency, uh, not before and after in 1920, was the group of Hainan people, and they are migrants from the Hainan island of China, and they came to. Um, the Singapore or Southeast Asia in general uh, later than the rest of the speech group. So the first thing is to know is that when we talk about Chinese overseas in Southeast Asia, that Chinese is uh, like a generic category, but there are actually different speech groups and they did not communicate with each other because they are uh, mutually unintelligible languages. And just like most of migrants to uh, South America, they were from the Guangdong province, they are either Hakka or Cantonese, but in uh, Southeast Asia, they might be Hogan, Diaoju, Cantonese, uh, so there are a variety of uh, speech groups in uh, Southeast Asia in the case of Singapore. And the Hainan people, they came late and they have uh, their number, the population, uh, as small compared with others. And then uh, while those, um, Ethnic Chinese, uh, for those earlier arrival, and they could assume a most influential position, and like the Hogan descendants or those who register as Paranaga or straight born Chinese in British colonial census, like one uh, example, like an uh, elite, this is a Diaoju migrant, uh, but with the Anglophone education and born in Singapore, class by a straight born Chinese, so different from Hainan, and from the observation of a British uh, lady in her writing that when they share a cup of tea and uh, the British lady, uh, Mrs. Florence Candy, uh, will observe this Chinese, it is a Diaoju, it is uh, so like someone who spoke English perfectly, but he was truly a Chinese. And although he never yet been in China, uh, he knew Europe well and also something about uh, his uh, good taste in, and his good uh, favorite in uh, roses. So that is an uh, observation from the European perspective that all Chinese, even if they were born locally, and uh, even they spoke English and uh, knew Europe well and never visited China, but because of this kind of racial background, so they are Chinese. So for, so the colonial perspective about who are Chinese uh, actually fit the very same model as what the Chinese government was doing. The Chinese government wanted to consider all like, Chinese descendants, regardless of their language and their cultural identity, they are Chinese. And also like the Japanese also adopted the same perspective. Uh, but for the working class population, I mean, the way that the experience of their being Chinese was very different. Like, okay, they will actually identify as one uh, working class, like uh, for the Hainanese people, there are new migrants, and for one single individual's trouble will be associated with the, the shame of the whole entire speech group. So they were also considered Chinese, but in the class hierarchy of the Chinese community, like the Hainan people, a migrant from the Hainan island, um, they were working like a domestic worker for well-to-do Chinese. Like Cillian was exactly the same person in the previous page, someone who uh, had good taste in roses and spoke English. And he, uh, so that is a very, uh, a case that when he's, uh, house was robbed and the thief, the ethnic background, the Hainan myth will be highlighted in the newspaper. And so as other uh, like uh, uh, the uh, report, like this is a report of in Pinan about a uh, 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 like the communist propaganda found in the Hainanese community, and the uh, uh, the caption of the newspaper will be "Welcome to Malaya." I mean, if you were not happy with this colonial status quo, what brought you here? And so I think the current distinction as the uh, what my concern uh, in 
my uh, uh, paper. And my paper started with an episode about uh, a memorial uh, ceremony for the founding father of the Republic of China in 1927. And that event uh, have uh, so the memorial ceremony have about two, uh, 20,000 people to attend for the ceremony. But in the end of the ceremony, there was a conflict uh, between the uh, participants, especially the Hainanese speaker. And um, the event was organized by the Cantonese, more like a Burjas class uh, that belong to the elite circle. And so after that, uh, uh, the conference, the police called the organizer to report it on what was happened. And so in the report, the, the organizer, this is a Cantonese called Bo Bo Liu. And Bo Bo Liu, in the way he recounted uh, the incident, and he talked about uh, how um, how that, that uh, uh, activity at, at large, I mean, at first went well, but all of a sudden a few Hainanese came up to give a speech like the, uh, the Hainanese. Now, they as organizer, uh, as someone who uh, wanted to uh, launch an event to honor the founding father of the Republic of China, and they did well to follow the British order. And what the British asked them was that they could have this large scale event, but no public speech. Um, and then, uh, but eventually the Hainanese, uh, they come from, they violated the rule. And then uh, the Cantonese could not, I mean, the, as or organizer, they could not use their Cantonese to uh, sustain the order because there's a miscommunication between them. So this is a show how the class distinction also went along the speech group to fight. And the two explanations I provided in my paper, I mean, also in terms of why 1920 would be less uh, special moment. The first, I mean, the background was that because in China, uh, that uh, the United Front between Communist Party and Chinese National Party ended around that time. So the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party came to the South and tried to mobilize the working class people. Uh, they, in the past decade, they couldn't contribute that much to the anti-dynasty revolution because they didn't have that much money as those uh, well-to-do it is. And but the 1920 will be the moment that the working class will, will work uh, to support the Communist Party. And the uh, evidences that I find uh, from the paper will be uh, after the United Front uh, was ended. That uh, the so this is earlier the dominant speech group. They have those uh, association that supported before 19. Uh, 11, they supported China's anti-dynasty revolution. And after that, they organized uh, their different like, uh, reading group or they work with a Chinese government as part of the Chinese, overseas Chinese Bureau. And while the working class, especially the Cantonese, after the mid-1920s, uh, there's a large percentage of them uh, attended those activities uh, in relation to the communist activities. And those communist activity was not only of about Chinese affair, but that is also about the general class consciousness. And those activities were also uh, along the line of Comintern. They have Comintern's representation, and also they have um, some instruction with the Chinese Communist Party. And that is uh, uh, um, like the um, rare moment for the working class people to uh, develop their political uh, platform. And the interesting thing about uh, how the policemen were hung down those communist activities because the colonial government in uh, Singapore, British Singapore, they did not want Chinese activism. That like even for the uh, movement to support the event in China, they have to follow the British colonial order. And those communist activities, given the fact that they have the transnational connection with other uh, organizations, so they were suppressed. And the government, so I checked the, uh, those, uh, their uh, investigation about the Gobi Dam, that is actually a uh, coffee houses. And those are the places where the communist propaganda were found. Um, a lot of uh, arrested communists from newspaper, they were documenting their Hainan background I mean, from a particular uh, speech group. And um, also, I mean, the population of Chinese, especially Hainanese, actually increased uh, between 1910 to 1930s. Uh, but the numbers of coffee dam or those coffee shop uh, register actually declined. And one reason was that uh, they uh, a lot of those uh, shop owners, according to the Chinese report, uh, mentioned that they did not uh, want to be put under the uh, governmental regulation because the government would uh, use the um, investigation of their hygiene and sanitary standard and to actually to check the uh, members, the, the, uh, the patrons there.
and then um I didn't show it some time. And so yeah, I mean so this is just an example about how um the policemen from this paper report, uh how they check the communist activities and the communist activities. So later on those communist uh, organization founded by uh, the Hainanese people in late 1920s in Singapore, they eventually become uh, the Malay Communist Party uh, that founded as formally established in 1930s. And the Malay Communist Party have the uh, transnational connection that were the communist, activity, uh, uh, communist activists in Thailand. Uh, according to the post-war uh, MCP leader, and he recounted that uh, if you know a little bit about the Malay communist uh, politics, there was the uh, post-war year that because uh, Malaysia in the post-colonial structure that developed into Malay's Malaysia and Chinese considers minority. And that was actually the identity that even Chinese uh, community will accept. I mean, they pretty much adopted the British uh, racial classification to that overlook the different that linguistic differences like whatever you as a Chinese descendant that you are Chinese and the Communist Party of Malaya because they did not like the um, the post-war uh, post-war the post-colonial agenda so they uh, stay in the jungle they didn't really come out after as independent until 1980s uh, 1989, and the leader, Chen Ping, uh, he recounted the development about why uh, Communist Party of Malaya eventually become uh, identified as a Chinese campaign rather than a uh, movement for the class interest at large. Uh, he mentioned that in the early stage of the development that the Nanyang Provincial Committee established in the end of 1927, and that branch uh, started to uh, have the um, non-Chinese member like Malays and Indian nationality to participate in that activities. And what happened, I mean, why uh, that uh, kind of initiative for a uh, working class population among the migrants from China, they speak this language that the elites could not understand. Um, and also at first they could find a, a political platform. They could associate them with other ethnic groups with a similar class background. So why class? I mean, this is a very classical uh, uh, sociological question about why class identity could not compete with ethnic identity. And in the case of the um, the Singapore uh, case, that let me skip some part of this. It is T uh, association. So in the Singapore case, that 1920s, uh, the late 1920s, the momentum for the working class to uh, establish their distinctive political platform, and that eventually uh, ended uh, with the 1930s the rise of Chinese anti-Japanese movement. That anti-Japanese movement became a background for the elites to work with the working class because they could identify their sheer uh, enemy and the communist uh, member also through mobilizing anti-Japanese boycott, they could get yeah. more support yeah. not beyond yeah. their uh, speech. Yeah. Um, two more minutes, maybe. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I mean, so so this is uh, the, uh, how is it, kind of survival strategy for the communist organization in the late 19. 1930. Uh, at first, I mean, they are only that like, among the minority speech group in the Chinese community. And the, later on, 1930, they realized that uh, by uh, signing up with anti-Japanese campaign, they can kind of expand their membership um, foundation. But that be eventually become a risky uh, strategy that after the end of the war, after Japan was no longer an enemy, and the Burjas class uh, was stopped uh, working with a working class community. And so the uh, Communist Party of Malaysia no longer got the support from the elites. And it is formed their uh, MCA Malay Chinese Association. And but also for the elites, there's another risky game I mean, by claiming their Chinese identity, because being Chinese being that you are perpetual aliens, I mean, you could not be considered local. And so they could only become a subordinate uh, members of the Arnold of Malay dominated political uh, campaign. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the question about and uh, also about identify like a gen generic Chinese identity is that in the second, uh, the bicentennial of Singapore's, uh, the rough standing of about the, uh, the end of uh, bicentennial of the British. Uh, establishment of Singapore that um, they try to like water down the so British inference and they have the different like ethnic representation and for the Chinese part the uh, person who was only represented is actually uh, elites I mean or from uh, like uh, uh, the, um, the those are uh, the those uh, 
Bergen class, I mean, dominant speech group rather than uh, the voices of those uh, minority speech group. And uh, so I think the end of the uh, presentation, I want to go back to the original question I proposed, like whether ethnic connection or the notion of diaspora could still be an effective, uh, like epistemic uh, framework for us to study uh, ethnic Chinese outside China. And I think my I, I would think that uh, that process remains to be effective, but first of all, I mean, to make sure that that process uh, is a transnational concept and this, because a migrant that's, uh, is um, being minority, but also have the connection with not only the homeland, but other like the uh, same speech group elsewhere. Like uh, the con I, I think that would be uh, very interesting to think about the connection between like the uh, Haga migrants uh, to Singapore and to South East, uh, to South America. I mean, from this kind of uh, transnational connection. And the other thing is about to uh, the importance of thinking about the diversity uh, within this uh, diaspora community, especially the class distinction. I think most of the study, even including my first book about a uh, connect will be on empire. I, I just look at uh, most of the Burjasi men. I mean, they see here to find your data, but I think it's important to think about um, how um, the over representation of, of especially the merchants, I mean, in the study of Chinese diaspora. Thank you, Wing. Uh, after we listen to all our three panelists, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Freddy Gonzalez, who is associate professor of global Asia studies and history at University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he will be our discussant of the of this panel. And uh, so, welcome. Um, uh, Freddie. Um. All right. Um, thank you, David. Um, I guess I'll just make some quick um, comments. Uh, sorry about the Zoom bombing, those of you who are coming in a little bit later. Um, but I'm hoping that um, in a few minutes we'll able to we'll be able to reopen um, the chat so that people who like heard the latter couple of presentations will be able to. Um, to ask questions, and um, you know, I'll, I'll try to be quicker on on removing um, anyone who's not supposed to be here. Um, so these three papers, um, as David mentioned in his introduction, are a part of this like larger project um, that crosses borders, right? And and crosses borders similarly to the ways that migrants themselves um, cross borders. And these borders are um, ethnic, they're national, they're methodological, um, and they greatly enhance our understanding of, of the the Chinese diaspora more broadly. Um, just like um, the migrants themselves, it, it's a part of this larger initiative um, to broach uh, these larger linguistic, cultural, and social um, boundaries. And it importantly brings uh, together the study of Chinese in different regions. And you know, often don't see this enough. Um, Southeast Asia and Latin America in this panel, um, but also in the volume of, of North America and Europe um, and scholars really from all around the world and representing institutions um, from several different continents. Um, in the US is, uh, traditionally was quite hard. Um, and we had a kind of separation of area studies um, from ethnic studies, which meant that scholars didn't really pay um, that much attention to race and migration outside of North America um, or the ways in which like um, the Chinese in different national contexts um, could be quite marginalized. Um, so in the present, right, there's like more calls to make Asian American studies, more hemispheric, trans-Pacific, um, to kind of look at um, migrant groups in either like larger, global, um, transnational, or in like comparative frameworks. And I think all three of these papers um, fit into these, um, into these uh, projects. Um, so uh, for Ben, Ben, Ben's paper is a comparative paper looking at Cuba and Peru, um, why coolies were more relatively more successful um, at rebelling in Peru, but not um, as much in Cuba, looking at factors like the role of the state, um, the possibility for cross-racial um, alliances. And it's a, a part of, uh, you know, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think a larger intellectual agenda of his in complicating the literature on the coolie trade, and in part by looking at it from outside this like self-contained lens of the, of the nation state. Um, I guess I'm wondering about other forms of, of resistance. Um, you mentioned a little bit about flight, but I was wondering about maroon colonies. Um, 
suicide is another form of, of resistance, right? So like th maybe thinking about resistance a little bit more broadly. Um, I'm wondering if the coolies were, were more su were successful in Peru beyond the cases that you mentioned. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I guess, if, you know, if there are any other explanations. Um, I, I kept thinking about um, the kind of propensity for slave rebellion in, in Cuba, um, you know, earlier on, it's kind of explaining um, some of these things. And I know you mentioned some of that in your paper as well. Um, Lorena um, analyzed the case of uh, Francisco Baca and this like super interesting, like multi-generational um, story, um, emphasizing these like slower processes of integration and cross-racial solidarity. Um, I, I, what I really like about that paper is that um, it, you know, implicitly uh, challenges and begins to reshape a paradigm that um, has largely been concerned with uh, racial conflict and struggle. Um, uh, you know, the ways in which uh, coolies were racialized, the difficult conditions that they faced um, as they were kind of emerging from um, the coolie period. Um, for Lorena, I was wondering about ways of integrating uh, family memory and oral histories uh, into the history of Chinese and Latin America more generally. Um, and maybe like your own thoughts on that, um, thoughts on, you know, the, the necessity of, of, of these kinds of stories. Um, it was one of the things that really jumped out at me was the ways in which they like try to send out uh, the Chinese name, right? Um, come up with multiple options. Um, for uh, Huang Guo, uh, the, this really fascinating paper on um, how Singapore Chinese uh, public sphere um, bifurcated a, a, among class, linguistic and political lines um, you know, communists congregating in coffee shops and, and, and nationalists congregating in, in tea receptions. Um, I agree with a lot of what you mentioned, um, especially your kind of larger questions about diaspora, your, your need, the need to uh, define it a little bit more narrowly, to kind of pay attention to the internal divisions. Um, I think we're in broad, broad agreement. Uh, my project, um, you know, I think has this like big global framework, but it is also defining it really narrowly because I, I focus on the Cantonese, um, Cantonese diaspora, especially on like free migrants, right? But like, I, I find myself often saying, well, it's not about these other groups who like fall out of my discussion. Um, so absolutely. Um, so with that, as I begin with removing attendees, um, I will uh, turn over to you guys, I guess, um, if any of you have any, uh, I'll turn it over to David, actually. Just uh, one last thing, I, I really did enjoy um, reading all your papers and excited about this work and excited about the volume. Okay, uh, thank you, Freddie. If you have any questions or, uh, because in the chat we don't have questions because, uh, I don't know if the from the audience if there is any who wants to ask or actually I have a also a question for Lorena. I don't know if um, this uh, surname uh, Francisco Baca Nino Ladron de Guevara is is uh, is our are there two two surnames, Baca and or is one surname Baca Niño and Ladron de Guevara, eh, Guevara together, eh, together all together? Uh, yeah, there are two. Like Baca is the first last name, and the second last name is Niño Ladron de Guevara. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. I know. It's just like you think about uh, Latin American names as long. This is this is one of the longest, I think. <laughs> When I was in China, I went to a hospital and then uh, because uh, they, they called uh, by the name and uh, in, in Chinese uh, for my name, David Ibarra was very long for them and caused them uh, because it's, it was, um, a, I mean, for the Chinese uh, in uh, like uh, Tucson, maybe it's not that... Uh, I don't know, do you know about the, the origin of the name of the Jew? Well, I, I know that, Sorry. Sorry. yeah, the Niño Ladrón de Guevara, it, of course, they, they were landowners too. And um, there is a link that I haven't been able to trace in paper, but 
I know that the, the Genaro Barragan family married the Nino Ladron de Guevara uh, family. Um, so I, I don't know how the name, like there, there must have been other marriages there with the, the people working in their, in their plantations, which to me seems interesting because they are of a completely different class. But I mean, this landowner Barragan, he, he died like three years ago. He was very, very old. Uh, so, but he was very lucid when I interviewed him and he was, um, he was, his attitude was very interesting because he was very open to, or it seems that in his life and his family was open to these other relationships. At least that's what came across in our conversation. Uh, but other than that, I can, I have to go back. And this is part of my, um, a book project that I have to go back and check on all these kind of relationships. But also to answer to Freddie's um, question, I think about the integration of, um, well, I was talking about this um, economy, what I want to call economy of affects, which is all these like um, interracial marriages that allow the creation of very concrete um, economic capital for many Chinese. And I'm not, I mean, I'm also thinking about um, Pedro Sulem, for example. Um, he, he was also like an, a very well-known intellectual. He was not, he was middle-class. I mean, he traveled to the US to study and then he went back to Peru, but he married to another immigrant, a German one. And he didn't want to talk about too much about like the Chinese um, struggle, but he was into the indigenous movement. But um, his wife uh, was advocating for uh, Chinese descendants. So that kind of uh, alliance um, in, ter in terms of social struggle is the kind of alliance that I would like to explore more. And I know there are other, uh, to some families that have the same kind of thing is that they marry certain people who allow them to uh, move their ideas, um, social ideas forward and also the economic capital. Um, and, and that happened in very interesting ways. Like also, for example, the family, um, the Polite Campo, I think this is a very well-known story. <laughs> But it's, it's very interesting that um, the Polai family was uh, on the left of the spectrum and they moved forward because they be, uh, with help of the Chinese association, which is another kind of uh, uh, economy of affects, if you wish. Uh, with that help, they move forward. But then um, Victor Polai Campo, the last generation, he, he became part of the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Party. So that's complicated because then they started this, you know, this uh, war, um, terrorist war. So th those would be like just my comments about like, um, I see this economy of affects in, in, um, that, that has been happening, but they, they have not been highlighted because those people who occupy very important intellectual and political positions are not highlighted in the history of um, Chinese history in Peru, for example. Uh, I'm Benjamin, I am interested to know uh, about the locations, uh, my question for Benjamin, uh, the locations uh, in which the haciendas were, um, uh, and what kind of plantations were, uh, were developed there in that plantations in Peru. And you talk about Matanzas in Cuba. So I, I, I probably think it's uh, sugarcane in, in, in Matanzas, but in central Peru, what kind of plantations do they uh, develop? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, in both cases, um, especially north of Lima, we're talking mostly about sugar also on the coast. And so these plantations are on the, on the coast. Um, uh, with the Andes behind them, right, to, to the east. And, um, and there's also some cotton in some of the, in the north, and then also some sugar and cotton to, and to the south of Lima as well along the coast, like Cañete area. And there are also Chinese working there as well. So there really is this sort of, uh, if you think of Peru already as a country that's um, 
very regional, right, between coast and, and mountain, and then also Lima versus the rest of the country. Uh, the, the, the Chinese experience in the 19th century, this indentured experience really reflected that for the most part, um, uh, sort of the, that, those regions. And they were, and, and it, it mapped onto, in many respects, the history of African slavery in, in colonial and early independent Peru in terms of where the bulk of African slaves and African descended, uh, descendants um, who were enslaved labored. So it's still a similar type of industry for the most part. And, um, and so sugar was taking off. There was this boom in the mid 19th century um, and cotton as well for export. And then there was also some who worked in Guano uh, as well to the south of Lima. Um, and then in the cities, like I said, uh, Chinese were working indentured. I mean, this is the same in Cuba and mostly Cuba is sugar, but there are Chinese like slaves in Cuba in all aspects of the economy working. Um, sometimes by themselves, but often uh, alongside or in the same industries with, with the enslaved. Um, if I can, before we run out of time, I'd just like to re respond to, to Freddie's question. And I mean, about resistance. And I think, and to me, this is also really interesting because I really like that my talk and paper is sort of um, juxtaposed with Lorena's because I think in a way they're the opposite. And yet I don't really think there's a contradiction there at all, honestly. And that's one of the things I've been trying to argue in some of my pieces uh, more recently, both on Costa Rica, Chinese migration to Costa Rica, but also in Peru and, and Cuba. And um, so the, there are other forms of resistance. I, I mean, you can think of classic sort of peasant and slave forms of resistance, the everyday forms that existed, um, sleeping, uh, stealing, uh, saving money, finding ways to earn money to purchase freedom early, seeking out the courts for protection to have their contracts um, respected or to try to gain independence uh, upon the end of the contract, which planters through various ways in both places tried to deny. Um, but thousands still did gain their independence during or their freedom during the so-called coolie era. So they, they were somewhat successful. Uh, there's violence, there is suicide. Uh, the Chinese were noted, uh, commentate, observers said, you know, that the Chinese workers resorted to suicide more than any other group that was, um, commented on and it led to investigations of treatment on plantations in both places. Uh, running away, I don't know as much about, I've never seen real, any evidence of palenques, like maroon communities in either place in terms of the Chinese, but definitely fake papers, forge, claiming free, free status and trying to integrate into the, that free Chinese community that was emerging as well. Um, or hiring yourself out to another place and sort of claiming a free status. I've seen evidence, lots of evidence of that. Um, and then there is this reality of cross-racial alliance and various forms of resistance, both the everyday forms um, and even in some violent forms, but those are never to the scale of a mass rebellion, more like a localized uh, reaction to an abusive overseer or something like that. Um, but I see a family, and I've written about this too, like family formation, cross-racial uh, relationships, uh, business relationships could be crucial to social advancement and forms of integration over time. Uh, and so I think those were there also. It's just the fact that there was also tension, right? Like you, it's not just one or the other. Um, and so I, that's why I like our papers together because it speaks to that dual reality. Sorry, can I can I add just a comment? Is that they either hate each other and kill each other, or they just love each other and have kids? So, <laughs> right, or there, or some people are kind of doing both, right? You know, like that you can, in certain more intimate settings, you form those stronger bonds, but then there's tension between larger groups. Uh, maybe uh, when uh, I'm I'm just in a pair of minutes because we are over time uh, in a pair of minutes maybe uh, you talk about uh, maybe about the heterogeneous nature of the immigrants because i read in the paper you and the paper you wrote about the hainanese and uh, other groups in 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 singapore that um, are are um, uh, competing each other right Uh, the, the microphone that you have to 
And one interesting thing is that uh, the Burjas members of the community in 1920s, they were promoting the Mandarin learning movement so as to eradicate the use of those uh, like uh, uh, topolites or different dialects. And so they would want to introduce the Mandarin speaking. And also we know that among all those mutually unintelligible languages that Cantonese, Hong Kong, Hogan, and Georgia, but they, the Chinese share the same written script. So the written script is the foundation to unify them. So there's one thing, and but for the Hainanese, they, I think the way that they could not really compete with the first just member in the society over uh, their social influence uh, to a large extent because most of the religious organization and uh, they have been or that was a uh, chamber of commerce under the name of the Chinese. Like they did not really have a representation like, uh, in, in that community. So they were, I think they were marginalized precisely because of uh, most of the uh, that association under the name of Chinese have been taken by other speech group. And so this is a way that they become marginalized. And, but my question is that uh, given the fact that they could have a chance to build a platform beyond the kind of umbrella category of Chinese, but why they in the end they will still merge with the Chinese that uh, the ethnic uh, circle. Um, I, I explained that with, in regard to the rise of anti-Japanese movement, they provide a convenient ground and for the ethnic solidarity to dominate and to replace the class divide. Thank you, Huin. Uh, okay, uh, well, now uh, uh, us. One quick question of, of Wayne before. Yeah, you um, have it. And I, just really quick, I would love to hear more about, it's the first case where I sort of hear about Chinese coffee culture. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that's like a Singapore thing or like wh where does- You mean the coffee that, DM? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, are, 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 how, how is it that sort of people are just like drinking their daily cup of coffee? Yeah, I think that is. Uh, I think the copy there is actually it's not just about copy. I think it's more uh, like the uh, the the. I think it started with the hawker, like the food stamp by the street. But then the governments have the uh, regulations about the hygiene and sanitary, so they uh, started to have more like a shop. Uh, but not really a formal restaurant. It's really they can come and go in and still they, and even in the post-war year, COVID. I mean, in most of the public housing, they become a kind of residential center for like a commoner commoners to uh, talk about politics. So it's it's very much. I think that's a little bit like what we talk about the. Um, the night market or street foods, I mean, it's something very popular in Asia, but in the colonial regulation, because they have the sanitary hygiene and restaurant licenses. So, but from the whole curve to Kobe, there is already a, a response and accommodation with the colonial regulation. But Kobe, there remain to be for the working class and not that a restaurant that you uh, need to have any dress code. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I don't know if we can uh, close now, right? Because uh, uh, we are over time. So I am um, thankful to all of you, Lorena, uh, Wayne, Benjamin, Freddie, uh, because I learned a lot from you by reading your papers. And also I would like, uh, I would say that is um, as a co-editor, uh, jointly with Laisaya Conchan and uh, uh, Ronald Sotokiros, uh, we had a, um, a good experience together as a, a, a co-editors of this uh, editorial project. And well, and all for all the audience, thank you very much for your attendance in this panel. And uh, maybe you can keep uh, in the other uh, panels uh, at three o'clock. Thank you very much and uh, have a good time. Good Saturday.